Hi, welcome to another episode of Bear Thoughts and this is a super special one because I have a very dear founder with me, Seher. Um, and on today's episode, we've chosen to talk about something a little close to our hearts, so a cause that we're um, sincerely championing for years now and that's climate change. And um, maybe Seher, we can start f- from your journey and backtrack a little bit. You've been on your personal zero waste journey for about a decade now, if I'm getting that right. And um, you've always shown a deep love for the environment ever since you were young. And you chose to pursue a professional life that was in close alignment with your values. Which moment in your life drove you to do what you're doing right now? Hi, Veena. So happy to chat with you. Always a pleasure. Um, thanks for asking all of these questions. I feel like we all need good little breaks to introspect and I feel like you're my sounding board and I create these little moments um, and conversations yeah. and chats to introspect. So thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, actively been caring about sustainability for, um, I think, about 15 years now, but tried to make it my professional uh, path as well for 10 years. And that's kind of been a combination of, you know, solar energy, um, industry stuff, lots of rural grassroots kind of stuff, um, you know, coming up with new areas in which we could solarize different things, um, and then to then starting by necessity. So it's been a a good mix of things. Um, You know, and I think a lot of times uh, we think that there is always an aha moment and one little, like, you know, you you get struck by lightning or this one thing happens. But uh, to be very honest, in my sustainability journey and entrepreneurship journey, I feel there are lots of like little moments that culminate into finally doing what you're doing or picking a path or picking, you know, why you want to do something. Um, we don't have that much time for us for me to go over all the nano moments <laughs> that have taken place. Um, but uh, you know, I think largely your question was around what was the few moments that you know. Uh, which moment really made me decide to try and do this. Um, and I think it was definitely looking at the waste problem from a ground up perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, I think my first part of my academic career was very much looking at what's going on in the world, um, you know, in terms of looking at the environmental science aspect and all of that. It was very bookish. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my first part of my career was more characterized more by field work, by experiential, and you know definitely um, educating my mind through experience on the grassroots, and that was largely um, kind of working in rural Karnataka, um, and that was super super informative. But I think the if I had to call it a aha moment was really working with the waste warrior community, um, and it exposed me to a lot of issues around migration, you know, housing, mm-hmm. um, you know, lack of infrastructure in terms of low-income housing, but also the obviously the waste crisis, which was um, very very obvious because they were a waste picker community, um, and you know, I basically visited a lot of nano landfills mm-hmm. with them mm-hmm. um, in order to try and just educate myself mm-hmm. um, about what was going on. And I think that for me, that whole experience working with um, the Waste Warrior community that lives very, very close to our Bangalore International Airport, Mm -hmm. um, which is also like a huge um, kind of highlights the stark disparity that um, I was really feeling experiencing at that time and continue to do so, um, was really kind of the the aha moment where I was like, I don't want to be part of this problem. Mm -hmm. And... I want to see how I can be part of the solution um, and it was a very individualistic journey for a long time mm-hmm. um, uh, and you know my colleagues really witnessed or uh, saw me do the small steps to the big steps to the crazy steps mm-hmm. to the failed experiments and everything mm-hmm. um, and um, you know really blessed them. My, my colleagues at Selco were my first guinea pigs for my workshop <laughs> and everything. Um, so yeah I think um, being in areas that accumulate a lot of waste on nano landfills all across Bangalore City mm-hmm. um, and humanizing the people that actually um, were gathering mm-hmm. these high value recyclables um, and these waste warriors was really kind of a moment where I was like I need to do better as a human mm-hmm. and um, yeah try to find a path that was more in alignment with who I wanted to be. 
you know, on the other side of the waste issue that you were just mentioning, lie the consumers, um, the individuals who consume products that eventually land up in landfills. And in light of this, conscious consumerism is also something that you've been advocating for a while and continue to do so. And um, when did you maybe decide to uh, extend the idea beyond an individual, um, say, an individual motive to make it more expansive for everyone else to be a part of your journey too? Yeah, for sure. I think it was through those conversations and workshops. Mm -hmm. um, and it was with, you know, those first few little talks, chats, workshops that we did around um, low waste living, around awareness, around what's going on with the global garbage crisis, where people were like, that's great, okay, that's overwhelming, but now what's next? And how can I be part of the solution too? And I would say, yeah, you can go to Buffalo Bag Collective, you know, mm -hmm. near Jenica, they give you all your groceries that are all uh, packaged free. And they're like, no, I, I live in Bengaluru or I live in Shajapur and Mongolo. So the idea was like, how do I make things more accessible? Mm -hmm. And um, basically, I was trying to address all of the pain points that I only experienced right. in my low waste journey. But since I was, um, you know, 24, highly passionate, highly motivated, um, I definitely did things that were not convenient or easy or accessible. Mm -hmm. uh, but I guess I wanted to see how I could, because um, I saw that people cared. Yeah, yeah. But I thought, if, oh, if, it, if since the, you know, the, the mindset is there, I, I see that the empathy is there, I see that people do care about it. Um, so if we make it more accessible, mm -hmm. it will help make more people kind of choose to live more mindfully. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I basically thought that bare necessities, um, you know, could be an enabler mm -hmm. to help people live more consciously and more mindfully in alignment with their values. Um, so that's kind of how it began and I think it was an extension of those conversations I had at workshops. Yeah. So actually the crux of bare necessities really is built on conscious consumerism, right? on mindfully purchasing the products that one really needs and requires. And under this brand philosophy, how do you keep the business going? You know, seeing that consumers, you're essentially maybe in a way trying to get consumers to exercise some amount of frugality, yeah. which probably goes against business profits and revenues. So how do you maybe deal with this dilemma? Yeah, for sure. Um, so one thing is, very early on the call to make only necessities mm, mm. Um, you know when I was in my early formulation journey and a self-thought um, <laughs> experimental and form I've taken a few courses in Bali I've taken a few courses in Bangalore done a bunch of online courses etc um, and experimented several in my mom's kitchen mm -hmm. but um, you know people are like oh why don't you make this you know um, lipstick or why don't you make this XYZ, why don't you know? I and I went through this path of being very intentional about we're going to make products that are just necessities, mm -hmm. so things that are in your daily mm -hmm. use um, that you will need. Like, I think everyone needs to shower, for example. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, soaps are one of our best in our portfolio, shampoo bars, conditioner bars, things that you need on a daily basis mm -hmm. is a one way to address um, this kind of, um, I would say a little model conflict around you know being trying to sell products when or making a, a brand that does sell and use those products and you know on the other side thinking about everything that you do know about um, resources and the environmental crises so that was one way to address it um, and then the next way is to be very honest in your communication mm -hmm. and I think I have lots to learn on that front but I love Patagonia and I think they do such an excellent job of just acknowledging it. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, um, you know, they, they stayed open on all of the Black Fridays, etc. sales, mm -hmm. which are traditionally the best kind of sales days um, in North America. Um, but they're also very open about their communications that, hey, we are also business. We also have, you know, um, bills to pay, employees to um, support. So we're staying open, mm -hmm. but you buy it only if you need it. Right. And, um, you know, and they even were bold in their communication of saying, don't buy that jacket. Mm -hmm. uh, so the idea is to just be so clear in your communication that mm -hmm. we're doing it, but buy it if you need it. Um, and uh, I think that's something that has been a huge inspiration to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like I've lots to learn on that and um, happy to continue to be on the process of learning too and do that as well. Yeah. I mean, since you mentioned Patagonia, we also look at, we track them very closely as a company, yeah. right? And one of the things that we track them for is 
their impact and mm-hmm. how they choose to measure it and communicate it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also a big part of bare necessities, right? And we're very um, conscious about measuring impact and putting those numbers out there. Um, is this something that you feel should be replicated by everybody? And is there a model that perhaps exists that other brands can choose to look at and get inspired from? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think very early on we tried to try and you know articulate our impact. I think our first impact report was 2018 or 2019 or something. And uh, the idea is, to be honest, for me, more of a self-evaluation tool to see um, how are we doing Mm -hmm. and how can we do better. And I think if you don't measure things, Mm -hmm. um, then you can't know where to start Mm -hmm. to make progress. Um, So for me, it's largely an educational tool, Mm -hmm. but also it's a way to communicate to people what our values are. Mm -hmm. And um, it's certainly not perfect. But it's a start. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the first few pages of the impact report certainly do that. It's Mm -hmm. a disclaimer. It's explaining that, um, you know, there are gaps in the ecosystem. There are data gaps, especially in the uh, subcontinent around ways. There is more metrics available, uh, perhaps, in the um, European and North American context. So explaining all of that, saying this is what we have, these are the data gaps. Um, This is imperfect, but this is our start to help articulate what we're trying to do and how we're trying to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. And so we basically try and report um, on the number of waste we divert, which is obviously all of the things that you lead, Veena, so you're actually in a better position to talk about this than (laughs) I am, but I'll try and just summarize. Um, Maybe the number of people we've impacted by virtue of talks, workshops, um, things like that. And I think it's important because it's like a little report card or a health checkup, right? You you need to do that in order to um, in order to uh, you know have just these little checkpoints in your journey. <laughs> so I think that's basically it. And um, yeah, so I think we should all do it. Um, obviously, we love Patagonia, um, one of the first few companies to really do this B Corp certification. Um, it's something that we've been so actively trying <laughs> um, for gosh more than two years now. Yeah. Um, and I think, uh, I, I feel like nothing really comes without hard work and I, even though it's a long a process, um, I'm so committed to it because I feel like it will help us do better um, and be better and it's nice to have someone accountable um, to as well, whether that's a mom, a workout buddy or a cop. I feel like these are all like social support structures. Uh, from an organization perspective or from a personal perspective um, that will help us keep be rooted and grounded to who we are in the long run um, and that's why I'm kind of committed to that. Yeah. What do you think about this because I know you do lead a lot of our impact stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Um, I mean to be honest this is the first time that I actually handled impact in any capacity right and I didn't understand the importance of it until I got down to doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing is like you said, it's really a report card. Every day when you work, time flies. We're just doing one thing after the next and we don't have time to maybe just sit down and look back at the progress that we've made and the change that we've created by virtue of that. And an impact report is a great way to bring everything to a culmination. Yeah. To then reflect and say, okay, we've you know diverted X amount of kilos of plastic waste from landfills. And that's quite something to say and to show off and be proud about. Yeah, know? exactly. So, um, and I really, this has also played an impact in my personal life because by the work that we do and because of the work that we do, I'm very conscious about the brands that I choose to support and um, purchase from uh, because it's so important that waste doesn't land up in landfills or any place that you don't want it to be. Um, so Bear has been a huge like learning curve for me in that sense and um, I only hope that we continue to do better and like you said it is a work in progress and it'll probably continue to be for a while yeah. but as long as we're working upwards we have nothing to complain about, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, and another thing I wanted to talk to you about was actually climate change which was really the crux of this episode but I didn't want to make it too morbid because mm-hmm. um, then it's probably disconnecting for people to listen to and it's not, it's, the statistics that are coming off, off late, um, they're just so sad and morbid and yeah. we don't want people to maybe just spiral down a rabbit hole of 
yeah. negative news and maybe not aspire for change mm-hmm. but having said that we can't maybe entirely brush it under the carpet mm-hmm. um and i'm sure eco anxiety is one of the consequences of you know climate change and the impacts that it has yeah as someone who's you know been on this journey for so long um have you experienced eco anxiety and if so how are you maybe tackling it and dealing with it and what are some of the things that you would recommend to people who are experiencing eco anxiety themselves yeah um to be honest when i first started my louise journey and i think a lot of people who knew me um meant like you know uh, in the beginning um knew how militant i was about my louise lifestyle mm-hmm. and to a point that it drove me mad like <laughs> it was really took a toll on my mental health mm-hmm. um because you know i was a type of person who if you're going to a music concert will then argue with the person who's you know drip, you know poor guy is probably just trying to do his job to let you in if you have a wristband but i'm saying can i not have a wristband can i have a stand mm-hmm. and it's you know and uh, i feel like i was just a uh, um i was i was just creating more um kind of stress and tension um on my life but also maybe uh, people around me mm-hmm. um and then the pandemic happened and by virtue of that i had to um let go of my uh, attempt to really be super low waste um or or zero waste and embrace a more low waste and mm-hmm. do what you can kind of a lifestyle and i realized that you know sustainability is people plan and profit and so with the pandemic i guess i prioritized people mm-hmm. and uh, because i felt like that's what i needed at that time and i think it was a really good moment in my own low waste journey and it was um i basically uh you know was like okay few things i have to order online now mm-hmm. considering the situ- situation and i maybe i cannot go to this bakery i cannot go to this grocery store i cannot do x y z and um i became okay mm-hmm. with that uh, so embracing my own personal imperfections was important in my low waste journey um and then understanding that a lot of people doing um acts of climate change climate action um etc is really really important for this to come into a meaningful um you know systemic change mm-hmm. um rather than me trying to just like be extremely self critical about all the things i i did to try and contribute um obviously i still segregate all of our mm-hmm. waste I, i still um you know try and um thrift as much and obviously incorporate a lot of um kind of things in my life that are in alignment with my value but i think i'm less strict as i was when i first got started um so i think um you know experience a very very severe eco anxiety took a toll on my mental health and then i realized that you know what this is what i can do and what i cannot do and kind of being very honest um about my limitations mm-hmm. um was really i think helpful in my my journey i think mm-hmm. um but what keeps me really happy grounded excited um about this space is the amount of innovation happening yeah i think um you know uh, battery storage is getting uh, sleeker sexier more mm-hmm. efficient um transmission and energy losses are much lower than it was um you know just everything you that we are currently looking at um there are so su- there are some someone is working on some solution that yeah. you know is making a change um whether that is uh, i don't know uh banana fabric your fiber used to make leather whether it is um photovoltaic glass and you know food parts that are made from it um to generate electricity um amazing kind of uh, equipment to help do mass cleanups in beaches um as es- you know estuaries um streams and what not um i think so there's just so many people mm-hmm. so passionate about basically leaving us planet in a cleaner way than they found it um and the num- number of innovations products um that are kind of enabling that mm-hmm. um is something that keeps me really hopeful grounded um and it's everywhere yeah and at least um you know I- I- what i'm surrounded by on a daily basis what i see online offline with people is really this echoing sentiment of doing better cleaner greener more just more equitable more in alignment with what we want to do for the future yeah. and that's what gives me a lot of hope and keeps me really happy <laughs> that's so beautiful and um maybe to for the listeners who want to make their lives a little more greener what are the five simplest things that they can do in order to do that 
yeah to make the lives green for sure i think composting it's so nice yeah. to do something that is using our phone not to not swipe and not scroll and not type and just be intimate with the soil um so i think um there's something so grounding it's so beautiful about doing screen free activities and i think composting is such a easy and good one yeah. and by doing so you're obviously diverting 60% of your waste um and i think that's a great place to get started um the other thing i would say is in terms of large scale impact since we're talking about climate change on this episode um is really looking at your emissions and if mm-hmm. you could um you know use a metro um, or use public transport or walk um I don't know make a small goal for yourself once a week twice a week thrice a week mm-hmm. uh, for starters I think that's a huge avenue to create uh, another impact um or the best next best thing obviously after all that is um carpooling mm-hmm. um you know when you're uh, if you are looking to purchase a car do a test drive for a EV as well just be open minded I bought my EV like 3 years ago and I remember everyone being like oh my god are you sure mm-hmm. like um you know what if the battery dies out and you don't have any other vehicle like all of this um but i think from just from 3 years ago to <laughs> now um there are more options out there and people are obviously way more um open to buying EVs and we're seeing a lot more on the road which is really exciting but yeah just kind of consider that with any option bucket um as well um and i think those are all like that that also the emissions from obviously transportation is a huge contributor um as well so i think that's another great place to get started um and then i think the third um i would say is you know just be mindful of your lifestyle mm-hmm. and if you could avoid single use plastic on a day to day basis please do so mm-hmm. whether that's reusable water bottles everywhere your backpack um you know tote bags in your glove compartment mm-hmm. your backpacks um keeping them just accessible yeah. um is really important fourth segregating your waste um and five is thrifting and um you know sharing clothes with your own family or um buying only what you need it's amazing thank you so much oh, thank you so much mm-hmm. <laughs> had a fun chat today. yeah so thank you thank you so much for your time i know how busy you are so it really means a lot that you spend some time on this Um and with that we come to an end of this episode. Um so continue to make zero waste the norm and not the exception. Thank you. Bye-bye.